I'm Allison Dollar. I'm the CEO of the Interactive Television Alliance. And uh, I will introduce our people. But I would like to sort of preface this by saying when we started the ITA back in 2002, among our founding members were ACTV and OpenTV, Liberate, and Wink. And all of the talk and the focus was on addressable advertising. And the notion of addressability was sort of overtaking even the idea of targeting, which was originally just after general demographic information to zip plus four, as we know. And then now, of course, we've migrated even further to uh, the sort of that next iteration of that, which is transactable uh, advertising that's also, of course, targeted and addressed. Yeah, so I think let's, sort of as an opening notion, let's kind of keep that in the back of our mind. Uh, let's see, I'm going to go in order, and sorry, there's so many I did have to kind of number this. So it's uh, Tal Chalazin, who's CTO of Innovid, Tobias Schmidt, who's the CEO of YY, Alex Terpstra, who's CEO of Civolution, Pooja Midha, who's SVP of Digital Ad Sales and Ops of ABC, which is a huge job, my goodness. And uh, uh, next we have is David Klein, CEO of In Sequence, which is one of the venerable companies and actually founding member of the ITA as well. And uh, last but certainly not least, we have Jeff Siegel, who's SVP of Global Media Sales for Rovi, which is the huge player in the room He's sitting here. So let's just talk about that, about the evolution from what you've seen in terms of dealing with your brand partners and other partners. What's the most different thing that you have seen? Why don't we start over with uh, David. Are you guys comfortable there? Because somebody can come on this side. Make a living. <laughs> Make a living. <laughs> <laughs> OK, elaborate Just see on that. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, so what was the qu I'm sorry, what was the question? Well, wh what has changed of where, from we're talking about the original kind of middleware days, right, and the advent of broadband, and then certainly a mobile and distribution having changed how much it has. What do you find different in working with the brand partners or trying to work with them? Well, what I've seen over the years, and in, in, you know, I've been with in sequence now since the summer, but my previous life I was with Cablevision in charge of all their ad sales for local and national ad sales for uh, 16 years. And I, so I'll draw on that. What I've seen is a huge acceptance by a lot of the buying community and brand managers to want to be more progressive with their television buying and what what they're doing you know if television doesn't change it's just going to stand still and die but what they're trying to do and what we're trying companies like ours and many of the companies up here are we're trying to do is to get them to make the television more powerful and one of the things we're doing to do that is to make the 30 second 15 second traditional spots much more powerful uh, for the advertiser by making them interactive. Um, with interactivity, the brand managers and the advertisers are seeing that they get the best of both worlds. They get the branding of television, which I think arguably is the, the probably the, the most powerful method in which to advertise. And then on top of it, they get, with interactivity, they get all these rich metrics of how many people clicked and how many people leaned in and it proves engagement and all those things. So well, I think that's, I mean, actually when you're talking about being progressive in our business, it is um, really all about the data now, right? Because originally the notion of being progressive was involving and engaging the end user consumer. And now, so Pooja, maybe you want to address that from the standpoint of an ABC. Um, what it means progressive to you, what does progressive mean to you in that context? Well, I think that, I, I don't know if I would agree that TV is going to stand still and die if it doesn't get better. I think it's actually very healthy and, and doing ex extremely well. I certainly think we believe in the promise of technology to further enhance what's happening on television and in that space. Um, I think that, you know, the current 30-second spot is still a very powerful vehicle. There's probably no great, no more powerful vehicle right now at scale. But again, I think that all the work that's happening um, in interactive television does have a lot of promise and is, is very exciting and something that you know we're excited to see marketers and broadcasters lean into. Um, in terms of the data being so powerful, I you know we hear a lot of conversation about that. 
Uh, I think right now, though, it's figuring out metrics that are meaningful and that actually you can look at across a campaign and then across different platforms. That's something that's still escaping, uh, you know, really the industry. And I think that's probably what's holding back further investment or maybe making it slower to happen than maybe all of us would like. So, Alex, and, and then uh, obviously Tal will talk about that. So what we see is that um, companies come to us talking about the effectiveness of, of TV advertising, even though it's still um, a huge, powerful platform, and nobody is uh, in disagreement there, I think. Um, if you do look into, zoom into the effectiveness of advertising, it is changing. And I think we're all, uh, we're all changing our behavior. We're all multitasking now while we're watching television. And in particular, during the ad breaks, we're multitasking. And so the second screen device actually is the, where our attention is going to a large extent during the ad break. So where I agree that interactivity around advertising is very important, I actually do believe that the second screen is the proper device to have that interactivity rather than, or at least it, it's, it's going to be more important than the first uh, screen in my view, um, because it's the screen that we already have in our hands, we're already using it for many different uh, things to do. And that's actually also what we as a company are focused on, to extend the first screen advertisement experience all the way down to the second screen and, and bring that interactivity fully uh, synchronized on the second screen. I wanted to chime in real quick and say that um, <clears throat> we see two things that are uh, mainly changing. Uh, one, uh, uh, taking what, what David mentioned, is, uh, is finally interactivity is, is making it to prime time. So uh, interactive video has been has been around for decades. Uh, I don't know the Jennifer Aniston sweater was in the light, uh, <laughs> late late uh, 90s that people were saying that you can click on things on television and uh, uh, and buy them. Um, but it, it's been kind of a pipe dream for a long time, and now it's uh, we see that it's it's really ma uh, making it to mass scale, and I think. The, the second thing that is making it happen is that it's uh, it's finally available everywhere. So advertisers are not needed to kind of think in a silo way and say it can only work in these scenarios when a user is using this device and uh, and on this type of network in this uh, screen. Now it can really travel between any type of screens that is out there on a, on an Xbox, on an iPad, on a desktop, on a smart TV, and an advertiser can really tap into this dream and say, I want interactive video and I, and I want to deliver it everywhere. I agree with what has been said here. I think um, from our perspective, I can't tell too much about the past because we are a rather new player focusing exclusively and primarily on second screen devices, on synchronizing advertisement on those mobile users um, that exist in great masses today. And I think when talking to our customers and partners, one thing that I observe is that what must have changed is that Traditionally, TV was a, a mass medium. The big advantage was reach. And now, on these multiple devices, second screens, uh, connected TVs, um, there's a lot more fragmentation. And I think um, what we as an industry and also what technology has to help is not only make it possible to have a sort of um, a prototype uh, a kind of one-to-one -one, uh, synchronized advertising, but also to make it a business model that's attractive for advertisers and for the whole industry value chain. And therefore, um, we also try to, um, to make it easy to book second screen advertisement and to allow um, advertisers in this fragmented new market that is sort of um, new to everyone uh, to still be in the position to reach a, a great mass of users. And well, I think, I think it, yeah. And so, Jeff, obviously, Roe V, you have incredible, crazy amount of reach. and Crazy. crazy. Just... It, it, uh, the numbers are pretty amazing if you look at Roby's, Roby's numbers. So the notion of what is progressive or not progressive, and you're talking from an operational standpoint, you know, the stuff has to get out the door, right? So uh, there, there, again, there's sort of the bifurcation of the notion of neat and cool things to do to engage consumers, to prompt a transaction, and what that call to action looks like now might be different. Uh, but... The expectation has certainly changed that all that data, all the, the way the metrics are done is all going to come back to them almost in real time. And that's certainly a, a sea change there from not very long ago. Yeah, I mean, we do a ton of research, arguably probably more than most, on uh, how people consume content. And I think what we've learned over the last 20 years or so uh, mm -hmm. is that people want to interact with video, whether that's within a show or advertising or whatever. 
I think we also believe that you know it's not just going to be the second screen. I think for some people it will be, but it will be about personalization. And you know some people may be comfortable with a second screen device. Some people may be comfortable with remote control. Maybe a smart TV. Maybe a gaming console. Whatever. People will find good content on any device, and they'll watch it, and it'll be customized for them. What we spend a lot of time doing is helping people find that content on any device. So um, we collect a lot of data. I would argue we don't have a data problem in this industry. We have more data than we know what to do with. We really have an analytics problem. What do we do with that data to make it smart across all platforms? Well, and, and also, again, I guess across the sort of act time axis. So I like you guys uh, to talk a little bit about synchronization. We've got a couple of products here, well, many of you do, uh, uh, that kind of address that exactly. So Civilution and YY, both of you might want to jump on that. Yeah, from a YY perspective, um, what we do is basically um, we monitor the TV program in real time and detect content, in particular advertising content. And the moment um, we find that a TV ad is being aired, we, um, through real-time bidding, by ad inventory that's out there on mobile devices um, with the users that are most likely to watch that particular type of content. So there's basically a, a two parts of matching. Part number one is identifying when a TV commercial is being aired, and part number two is identifying what are the users out there that are with a high likelihood watching that TV commercial. And then um, through real-time bidding, um, we buy this inventory and offer advertisers basically a one-stop shop um, solution for second screen in advertising. Because what we find in the industry is that um, there are a few players with dedicated second screen apps, but to be very honest, um, it is limited. And out of these three quarters of smartphone users that apparently, and I think it's true, use their second screen device while watching TV, only a minority is in actually dedicated second screen apps, and a large majority is doing different stuff. They use their social media stream, they read emails, they read the news, they might be distracted. And also these users we want to reach, and therefore um, um, we buy into that inventory out there that's traditionally not TV related and make the link to the TV ad. Just one thing, we actually find that is the rule rather than the exception. And when people are watching content, they're 90 plus percent of the time not using their second screen device to work with the content that's on the screen. It's actually doing something else, surfing, social, or whatever. But again, I think that device still is the first device that you want to use if you want to interact with content. You, you will use something that you have in your hands rather than, I think, the remote control of a traditional TV in that sense. I agree that um, um, we do a similar thing, but we position ourselves slightly different. So we don't buy ad inventory, but we do do the identification of advertisements on TV, but then on a very large scale. Um, we do that on about 2,200 TV channels uh, worldwide. And we connect that uh, directly to the guys that do, let's say, a large scale uh, inventory buy. So the, already the existing players in the value chain, the ones that uh, advertisers are already likely to be using today. So we connect um, that real-time identification service to what is already existing in terms of uh, real-time bidding today. Yeah, to, to just comment on this, uh, you know, first to, to, to clear something up, I, I agree with you. I think I even wrote an article a while back on, you know, the 30-second uh, ad is death has been greatly exaggerated. I think it's it's still very alive and well, and, and a lot of the things that a lot of our companies are doing are making them even more relevant and more powerful. So that aside, you know, talking about the second screen, in sequence, uh, our company is sort of the bridge uh, from today to the future. In terms of today, if you're an advertiser, you have to have wide distribution. You, you need a lot of eyeballs. And right now, where those eyeballs are, are on traditional you know, methods of distribution, you know, in, in the uh, 75, 80 million households through cable networks or broadcast networks with over 100 million. Um, so we're cognizant of that and we're really trying to make those ads more relevant and more uh, powerful by adding interactivity to them. But we've also got our eye on the future too with um, smart televisions and over the top devices as you, you were talking about. Um, but if you're an advertiser today, you need to have that scale and you need to have that big audience 
to make to make your advertising powerful. But we do believe, and no, no one's here now. We know that some of the viewership's going to these other devices, so we will be there when there's a critical mass for advertisers. Well, let's talk about that because uh, most of you are working with extremely large brands and many of you are working with some of the same brands because as we all know, there tends to be the corporate culture in some places where they are more progressive or not. So you see a lot among automotive or Red Bull and, and Samsung, many of them uh, you all work with all the time. So, uh, and Innovid uh, is clearly has a commitment to reinvigorating pre-roll. Um, so that's you know right there, pretty innovative. So we're here to talk about innovations, really specifically in the real world. So let's go back uh, to let's start at the end with uh, with our Rovi friend. And what's some recent example of something that you thought, okay, this is really pushing that envelope? Because we keep coming back to the crux of the matter here, which is reach and scale, right, versus timeliness, versus all of the um, personalization side and the direct transaction. And they still are a little bit at odds. So anytime we're finding things where you can bring those together, we're measuring those in excess, but then how are they measured? So. Talk about an innovative thing you did with a brand and name the brand if you would. Thanks. Yeah, I would add to reach and scale. I would add functionality, a consistency, and the analytics. I think what we find is we, we have done now thousands of campaigns. We look at video across all platforms, whether it's mobile, tablet, web, connected devices, or set-top boxes. We're really one of the only companies that has access to all five of those. We collect data back from that. Um, and we, we scale these advertisers across all these platforms to make it easy for them. But I would say that the advanced platforms will not scale until we get people to use the devices and until it's easier and fits into the back office of the agencies. Today it's still you know, chicken and egg in a lot of ways and we are fighting for every dollar to get on the platforms because it's not easy to buy. It's, it's easier to do the creative because we scale the creative across all platforms but it's not easy to buy. It doesn't fit into one of the neat planning buckets in an agency and it won't for a while so we have to kind of get over that fact. Um, there's no standards across all the different devices, and that will change at some point. And it's got to be more than just a pre-roll on a big screen TV device. It's got to have some kind of other interactivity that makes people keep going back. If they click on today a display ad unit on a, a connected device, and it takes them to just a pre-roll and nothing else, with nothing on the back and no payoff after that, they'll never go back to that again. And that's what we're seeing from consumers. So we spend a lot of time trying to figure that out. We've done a lot of campaigns with Red Bull, with American Airlines. Uh, a lot of the automotives have been very aggressive in this space. Any big ticket items that want to sell, a lot in the entertainment space who want to show um, episodics and trying to do catch up and trying to bring people up to speed on their content. So to that end, so Pooja, is there a, a time where you were like, wow, that really hit the mark and we were happy with how that worked out? Um, <clears throat> in terms of like a partner program? Yeah, or? With the, well, a partner program or a specific campaign, sure. even that somebody else did that was affiliated sure. with. Sure. I mean, I think, I, first of all, I, I totally agree with you that we, we've got to make it easier for people to buy across the platforms. That's what's really good on Leash Investment. Um, two upfront cycles ago, ABC came to market with something that I would say is very progressive, uh, which was ABC Unified. And it was the idea that if we are putting our content, our long form content, everywhere consumers are, so that means you know we started out with our full episode player on the iPad and then quickly moved to other iOS devices, Windows 8, Kindle, Android, connected de devices um, and screens. We're moving on to consoles this year. But the idea that you could buy that as well as the big screen television with one buy, one CPM, one guarantee. So again, just trying to make it easier for video to flow across screens and for investment to flow across screens. And I think, first of all, the partners that came along with us on that journey in the first year were definitely very progressive and we've seen a lot more uptake uh, in the second year. And so that continues to be somewhere we wanna just keep pushing forward because we know that that's in everyone, that's in the market's interest. So which certainly. partners were they? So there were a lot of partners, but one partner I would, I would highlight as being not only very progressive with Unified, but very progressive in terms of taking all the things that I think make a great consumer campaign and going further would be Verizon. Um, they, uh, this fall, uh, to give a recent example, they worked with us in a campaign for uh, Marvel's Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., huge fall show launch. Uh, they came in very early in the development cycle and made sure that not only was all of their cutting edge technology showcased authentically in, in some of the things the agents use in the show, but they actually worked with us to create, you know, advertainment, if you will, which is, you know, a five to ten minute show that 
called Verizon's Declassified uh, that really dives deep into either the social chatter going on around the show, what's happening behind the scenes, or actually showing more about the technology that's being shown because we know that's of interest to the audience. Um, that has actually been distributed across our entire footprint, as well as Verizon's, as well as we've syndicated it out to you know, other third-party sites, and we're seeing millions of views. It's actually got its own following. And so, you know, in addition to having the video content, we actually created an interactive gallery that then deep links into, you can actually go and explore that Verizon technology on the Verizon site if you want to go further with it. Um, but creating all those different interactive layers, making sure that we're surrounding something socially, as well as being deep inside the content in a very authentic way, is something that works. And what is great about it is that Verizon believes in being on all the platforms, as we do too, and I think that's what's making it exciting for consumers, because they see that complementary piece of the show that enhances their connection to it wherever they are. Well, and that really is what it comes down to, the brand having the commitment and the vision and also internally, to your point, being able to move on these things quickly enough. Yeah. yeah, I wanted to say I have two examples, and I, I actually don't really agree with, uh, with Jeff that, um, that it's, it is still complicated. Yeah. I must do it. This is the panel. This is what you need to do. <laughs> um, so uh, thank you for the laugh. Um, where was I? Uh, you were agreeing with yeah. me. <laughs> yeah. You were saying. No, so first of all, about the simplicity. So uh, I think that we all kind of making, uh, shooting ourselves in the leg and saying that there is mobile video, online video, desktop video. And I think the main thing that we are shooting for at Innovate, and we're saying it over and over again, is that it's, it's all just a different screens. And uh, we, it's for the sake of a lot of, uh, a lot of other benefits, people uh, encapsulated in different silos, but, but then we need to break them and say that this is all video and people watching Grey's Anatomy on, uh, on a tablet or on Xbox, on a desktop, they don't care what device is it and what's the technology underlying it. So uh, we, are, we are here to make uh, advertising thinking in a screen mentality and not, uh, not in a platform uh, way. And in terms of examples, um, and we're showing it here uh, later today, uh, we did a big partnership with Sony Pictures um, and uh, to run every movie release uh, across every device and allowing the advertisers to write uh, Sony Pictures to uh, deliver more assets. So if someone watching uh, an ad for a Sony Picture uh, movie, uh, in this campaign that I'm showing here was This is the End uh, earlier this summer, um, the user can see a 30-second spot, and if he's interested in, um, uh, in James Franco or other uh, funky people that are participating in this movie, I can use my remote, my finger, my mouse, whatever device I'm on, tap, and then it, the screen will expand, and essentially we're bringing the microsite of the, of the movie into the screen where you are, so you don't need to click and go away to the Sony picture landing site, you will, uh, you will get everything pushed to you to, uh, to the same screen that you're at right now. Can I just respond? I, I don't think we disagree on the creative. I think the creative part of it is the easy part. You can get scale and creative with companies like ours collectively. I think the challenge still remains at the agency where you've got digital budgets. In some cases, they don't talk to the TV side. You've got TV budgets. You've got outdoor budgets. In some cases, we're funded by all three or four out of radio or something. The problem comes into the stewardship of the campaign in the back end. When you do a post campaign, it says, is it a CPM based deal? Is it an impression based deal? Does it fit neatly onto one post? It's, the stewardship of these campaigns is still cumbersome. And that's well, but the look, agency. I mean, when we were first talking about the stuff, you didn't have CPC, CPA, all of the stuff that's come in on the IAB side of the fence and, and uh, other, well, otherwise on the OTT. So, Maybe somebody else talk about another example in the context of doing those deals because that's, that is a, some doing that it takes to get all that stuff signed and done for the scale that you were talking about. Well, uh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to give you the mic. Oh, I'll take two. Um, no, I, I agree that I, 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 it's hard not to agree with you, Jeff, in terms of it's complicated. Uh, uh, nobody, nobody's wrong here. Everybody, you know, we're talking around the the issue that you know it's hard to get people who've traditionally bought things to look at it in a different way. It just takes time and, and you know, you gotta wear them down over time. But I think that's what's starting to happen. I mean, you, you mentioned cost per click. You know, what we're looking at is a cost per engagement. So you know, I know we all talk about how sexy it is to have all the data and that's really important, but from our perspective, you know, the engagement factor of making the television or a second screen or whatever device you're on, 
making that that experience uh, more uh, more interactive, and then being able to measure it, and then being able to to monetize it is, you know, th those are hard things to do, you know, today, but they're getting easier. They were a lot harder a few years ago. They're a lot easier than they were a few years ago, and, and three years from now, that'll be even easier. So I think the metrics and the engagement and the, uh, that, that'll all get measurable, and, and what'll happen is the monetization of that is gonna change just with it. You know, it's, you know, soon someone won't pay a CPM on, on a, like they do traditionally on television. Maybe they'll be paying a combination of a CPM and a cost per engagement. So if you know somebody's engaged with your ad, that's valuable and you'll, you'll get paid on that. So it will change. It's just, you know, there's a lot of legacy things out there and, you know, it, well, and much it, of the it just legacy, well, often we focus on technology when actually it's just operation structure and even, in fact, uh, how people are compensated, right? They're not really rewarded necessarily to get out of those silos. So, that's, so that sort of leads me to the other thing we were talking about of when you've gotten a brand to say yes, what is it where they've said yes or what has been the, those factors? So, Tobias, why don't you give us an example of some of the I things mean, you guys are working on? From my perspective, um, what we are targeting as, as customers currently is those that do already TV advertising, traditional TV advertising, and make it easy for them to book complementary second screen advertising on top. And that's actually something that we find uh, advertisers are very open to. That's what actually what they are looking to these days. Um, um, so we didn't really have the issues of, well, this is not interesting, or could you please change this? Um, that, that wasn't yeah, the hard thing. because you already came in when it, it was already fashionable. It, it's, it's, I think it still is because, a very right, I mean, fashionable... Right, I mean, it all is whatever sort of is trendy at the time, and not to demean it at all. It's just that we sort of... A, there's a lemming quality that happens, and some of that's driven by Wall Street, fortunately, or, or not. So go ahead. So I, th I think it, it's true. The, the, it's, it's, it's a sexy topic. Advertisers are generally willing to do it, um, but they want to have it easy... Little work must fit into their budgets, so that's really where the work is on the sales side, on the organizational side, and in, in sort of tapping into it. And then what I also feel sometimes is a bit misunderstood is now it's all digital, it's all measurable, it's all clickable. So let's take the web metrics and and use them for TV. I don't think it's good either because one of the big advantages for TV used to be and still is reach and also brand campaigns. And if you have a brand campaign and want to sort of combine it with a second screen campaign, which I believe makes a lot of sense, and we have, uh, we have done some, some tests and studies on that, it's not right to sort of measure it by the number of clicks, because still this sort of brand impression, even though it was on a different device, is with the user. Yeah, so, the um, awareness is still very important. So, so exactly. give, it a, so, so give our a specific example. Re recommendation is, um, a lot of discussion is about the reporting structures and what to measure, and um, um, stick to the traditional TV um, uh, metrics and make them sort of adapted to, to, to the web. Like, there's a measurement like active GRP, which is promoted by Google and others, which is sort of gives the media planners and the advertisers a measurement that they are already used to and extends it to the, to the digital world. I think um, uh, for many brand campaigns, that, that's, that's a good way of doing it. Maybe I can add another example uh, that <clears throat> where we've been working with where simple metrics actually were found very important. Um, and that's, for instance, to connect social advertising with TV advertising. Um, and then large platforms. So one of the things we did with one of our ad partners, uh, Optimal Social, uh, was to drive um, ads on Facebook through the Facebook exchange in sync with TV spots. And there we ran together with optimal control groups to actually measure how people were responding to those ads. In this case, it was also an entertainment company, not Sony Pictures, but uh, a similar one um, um, for a movie release as well. And um, what we saw was that uh, we ran three control groups um, to compare the results. And one was just measuring um, um, clicks on the ads on Facebook without being synchronized to TV. One was um, the same, uh, same brand uh, and same ads synced between TV and, and Facebook ads. And the third one was actually competitive. So it was Facebook ads of, of our advertiser, but they were synchronized to competing ads on TV. And the results were, were pretty amazing, actually. So the, the synchronized version, same product, same brand, had an, um, a click-through increase, a lift of 60%, which was quite amazing. But even the competitive uh, example, the lift was still 35%, which was 
uh, something that never, no one actually expected that, uh, that would be the case. So simple metric uh, that was measured uh, on Facebook, um, but with huge results and uh, was really blowing people's minds uh, when we did this. I can confirm that we did a similar study, not on Facebook, but on display um, with the German um, FMCG company, Vileda, and uh, together with TNS InfoTest. You can download it. It's, it's, we made it public. Um, the results were um, amazing. We got an uplift on, on all the KPIs, um, but also not only on click-throughs and traditional sort of web metrics, but also brand awareness, purchase intent, and these sort of soft factors that it focus groups. Um, and I guess the reason to explain this behavior is and there's also other studies about that. The moment the ad break comes on, the attention goes away from the first screen to the second screen. So that's why uh, uh, the, t the attention sort of raises and, and it gives an extra effect compared to a control group that we had that had only first screen advertising and nothing on the second screen. So Jeff, what about the luxury brands and the UI that, um, and navigation? You found it was really very, very successful when you did some embedding there, right? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, we see brands all over the, um, you know, from premium down to smaller ticket items. We've actually seen consumer packaged goods start to get into interactive video across all platforms in a pretty big way. Unilever's done a lot of great campaigns for selling, you know, Hellman's mayonnaise, for instance, which is a surprise to us initially, but um, I, I think it gets back to how they want to price video, and it's the agencies are having a tough time saying, look, I don't want to go down the same road that we went down with the display where there's a race to the bottom in CPMs, if it's clicks or anything, against a premium inventory, and that's video. And that's a real challenge. Um, we've done things with, you know, uh, big ticket items like cars, as I mentioned. We've done a lot with a uh, number of the different autos, both domestic and foreign. And now they're repeat campaigns, which is encouraging. So I think they've figured out where those bumps are in the road, and we've helped them work through that. Um, but Lincoln's done a number of campaigns. I mentioned American Airlines has done a lot with us. Unilever's done a lot with us. But in the UI? In the UI where, yeah. Because that, it was this actual study that you commissioned or that was just based on internal fact yeah, finding? Yeah, it's been in the UI and it's, it's studies that we commissioned. So what, the thing that makes, I think, what we've really focused on is search and discovery across all platforms still is scalable because people have to look for apps, music, books, games, TV shows, whatever it is across all these different platforms. So what we find on smart TVs, for instance, is people sometimes just go right into Netflix. They don't use the apps as much as we'd like them to. But the interface, they're surfing around, they're trying to find out what they want to watch, and we're serving them with ads as they're going through that experience. So we do ads, and we do research on how they're interacting with those ads, and we also do a lot of panel-based studies to see if they like the ads, what size they should be, what color they should be, all that kind of thing. So Pooja, oh, go ahead. Well, I just wanted to add to this, you know, the business that I'm focused on is not necessarily, you know, as deeply involved in the interactive layer as I think some of the other companies that are here. But what we've found is that we have partners from every category and from all parts of the marketplace. And it's really, it's, it's virtually all of our partners now working with us across screens. So they are buying our video regardless of the device, and they're buying it along much the same metrics as they would buy traditional television because we've made that simpler for them. I would love to hear just like a pricey of a conversation that you have typically with those people? Like in your day-to-day, -day, you're in your office, somebody calls you, what do they say about that? You know, I, I think the questions that we got early on and that we needed to answer were simple things like, you know, the ad engagement is going and, and recall and all of the brand metrics hold across devices that we see the same level of completes across devices, that ad enjoyment and content enjoyment doesn't change regardless of the screen size. Um, that actually, it, when you run across devices, you reach some of the most desirable parts of the ABC audience. You reach people that are generally younger and more affluent. So, you know, I think those were the questions that we got asked that we had to answer, and those are the answers we've given. And it, it really has made our business very different than it was four years ago. Well, in sequence, I mean, you all have done such a range of things and really been a leader for so long. What's your perspective there in terms of having those conversations with those brands. I mean, they come to you, and a lot of times like, they're probably still asking for custom solutions in a way, which seems kind of odd when we're talking about scale. Yeah, th that's a, a great point. Um, and, and the focus of the company now is, uh, you know, we'll do interactive um, in-programming applications, but more and more now where we're heading is to try and build our nas a national platform for advertisers, because that's really what they're asking for. They want to have, they want to, 
if you're a network such as yours with 100 million households or a cable network with 70, 80, 90 million households, you want to have all your subscribers be able to interact with ads. So our focus has been of late trying to build that out. And, you know, we have a, a right in this room after a newsmaker session to talk a little bit about some news we have with that. So. So you know, from our perspective, um, you know, I've had a lot of conversations with advertisers about this national ad platform. And I will tell you, they're very jazzed about it. They want to have an easy way to make an ad they're already spending, you know, millions of dollars on to be, to be um, displayed on cable networks or broadcast networks made interactive. And that's really the, the focus of what we're doing. So I, I can't give you any specific yet because we were launching in the first quarter there um, but but I will tell you you know we wouldn't be going down this road had there not if there's not a, a need for it and a, and a voice need for it and we're we're hearing that so again I started off the panel by saying we're sort of the bridge the bridge from today where a lot of eyeballs are which is on the the main screen but we're we're certainly aware of where they're going and over time they're going to go to other devices and we we think those devices won't be as difficult to get into as it is to get into, a, say, the Hopper for Dish or Comcast set-top box. Well, and a lot of that comes down to watermarking, fingerprinting, all of that sort of stuff. What is the uh, panel's view of Ad ID? Because it comes in and out of discussion, and certainly 4As and A&A are still behind it. We've endorsed them way years ago. Uh, but it's not in common parlance to, to the point they're saying. What, what do you guys think? One of the things that um, we actually think about it is that Ad ID could be a very helpful tool, but it's not, a, it's not an open platform. So we would love to see Ad ID opening up and make it available to the whole industry, which I think would be an advantage for Ad ID as an organization. It would be an advantage for companies like ourselves, but also for our customers. Uh, I think it would be an advantage for everyone. Okay, so from your lips to God's ear, it's gonna go out. So I wanna sh shift gears just a little bit and uh, last 15 minutes talk about future because we always end up doing that because we can't help ourselves. Um, but right now, who would you say is the, are the largest, the big companies that are having the largest influence on, and we're just gonna start over here with you, Tom, uh, on what you're doing right now? And, and obviously why. Sure. Um... Thanks. The largest influence on what we're doing, uh, I don't know, Innovid? Um, yeah, no, no, no Apple. Um, I would say the advertiser is, uh, would be the most, uh, most important one. So um, to now go back to what I said before about, uh, about the scale and about advertiser tapping into this cross screen and believing into, believing into the stream. So clearly the, the more advanced side of the spectrum on the advertiser are uh, very fast to, uh, to jump in, the, the entertainment, the automotive, and others. And we're starting to see, uh, as Jeff said before, kind of crossing the chasm and, uh, and getting more CPG, more pharma, and more financial advertisers uh, playing along, but it's still, still slower or, and, uh, and not as mass scale as the entertainment guys. And this is something that, uh, that we want to see more, is, uh, is getting more kind of more traditional advertisers understanding and, and believing into the stream uh, and delivering their uh, interactive video and delivering everything, all their assets that they do have on their owned and operated sites into the kind of the commercial space. Yeah, I think from the second screen side, um, what we witness in terms of the publishers that are most active and that are really focusing on this, um, it's probably Twitter claiming the place and, uh, and also Shazam, um, however, um, if you look at the whole market and all the users, also these two only make up a very small fraction and, and, the, and the rest is very fragmented. And um, yeah, then companies like ours, like Huawei come and say, we want to sort of help um, uh, advertisers deal with that fragmentation and, and bundle it and, and get those second screen users um, um, uh, while they watch TV. Um, in terms of who is innovator and who is sort of active in that space but might not be recognized that much, I think, uh, at least in, in Europe, um, Facebook is, is quite a big one. And uh, um, although they don't claim themselves being a second screen platform, de facto they are. So from Solution standpoint, uh, and, and again, we promote this synchronized advertising experience, really <laughs> bridging the gap between TV and digital. 
Um, and make TV spots actionable on the, on the second screen is where we believe the value is. And the biggest influence for us, I think, is what we get back from the market is scale. And um, the fact that, that we have such a huge reach with uh, the, the monitoring platform that we have built over more than 10 years um, with a presence in 60 countries. And um, so the, the scale we can bring there to reach consumers for a synced experience uh, to TV spots is something that, in particular, the large uh, media agency uh, holding companies and their trading desks uh, find interesting to work with us, because through a platform like ours, they can reach a huge scale for their global so, But which among those are influencing you? Um, for instance, a company we do a lot of work with is a company called Zaxis, uh, part of the WPP uh, group. So we do a lot of work together to really fine tune uh, the whole synced experience and, and roll it out and push it out at scale and the reach that they have in terms of their scale of buying inventory, our scale in how we can actually monitor TV channels and sync to ads on TV at scale, that's a perfect match. When I think about the big company most impacting my business, and, and I mean this, I would have to say it's the Walt Disney Company. Um, not only is it the mothership, um, but it is um, the source of you know rich data, which will have big impact on the future. It is one of our biggest partners, all the studio businesses, the parks, everyone else. There's several businesses there that are both partner companies as well as customers of ours. Um, and you know, at the heart, we are building technology that's impacting every one of our businesses you know, in different ways. But for example, the way ESPN is going to develop their video is going to impact how we may choose to develop our video. So I would say it's the Walt Disney Company. The question was really uh, what companies or uh, groups really influence what we're doing today. Yeah. I would have to say that it's the advertising community for us. Um, they want they want scale. They want to be everywhere. They want to you know uh, buy it once and have it served everywhere. They want metrics. They want interactivity. They want it all. So close behind them, though, I, I would say they're number one in our mind. But close behind them would be the the delivery, the, dis the distribution of how that happens, that's pretty important to us. You know, there's only a handful of them, but they're, they're critically important to the chain. And then from, from our perspective, equally there would be the, the content owners, because they're the ones that are making this stuff available on their advertising. So uh, AMC is an example. If they wanted to make BMW ad interactive, you know, we would need to work with them on that. And so to me, it's the advertisers for sure, number one, but we're being influenced too by the distribution out there as well as the, uh, the cable I mean, I'm sure every day everyone wakes up and says, what's Google doing today, right? I mean, we can't, some of those 800-pound gorillas. You can't out Google keep, Google. Right. I mean, right. You, so you can't ignore them. They're 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 but at there. At the same time, they are they are something unto themselves. Um, and you know, we're a content company first and foremost. Google is Google. Um, they're not a content company, uh, at least not first and foremost. Um, and so, I would I would agree with you. I think there's other players in the space that you know. Make well, you don't impact. want to name any of your favorite children. No, but I mean, I, mean, I, I have I to say... With, I agree, though, that like the MVPDs, for example, right. very important partners, you know, very important to what happens next. Um, I think that, to me, I'm, I'm, that's more interesting, actually, for our business than what Google's up to, because like I said, you can't out-Google Google. Mm. Well, and I think, you know, we've kind of come full circle in this conversation, and, and, which is there are really only about 50 brands where we see them everywhere, right? It's the same automotives, it's, it is the, the same studios, the ones where they have management where that is progressive and has an idea about how to move these budgets around are the ones that are doing it. They're the ones getting nominated for the uh, ITV Emmys. It's, it's the same people, basically. So a lot of that comes back down to where we are. So go ahead. Yeah, I would say Google actually represents an opportunity for most of us on this panel because most people in the industry behind closed doors are fearful of Google content owners. And I don't mean that in a bad way. I just mean that they don't want necessarily Google to come in and have a race to the bottom for their valuable content. So that represents an opportunity to build an alternative to Google in a lot of ways. And that's really what's driving a lot of the innovation, in my opinion. Um, I think what we're going to face, I would agree, advertisers really drive everything we do from where we sit uh, and the consumer. But I would say we're going to face this tipping point over the next whatever X amount of months, years. As we get to scale, 
advertisers want scale today because it's easy and they want to reach a lot of people. They're going to get to the point when once they get scale, they're going to want to look at this as a cost metric is in terms of engagement in some form or fashion. There's going to be this nexus of saying advertisers want to pay for engagement and content owners want to pay for scale. And that's going to be an influx in the industry that's uh, it's coming down the tracks. And that's a, it's a scary thing, but it's got to be addressed. Well, let's wrap up really quickly just with the notion of when you have that environment, what does it look like for actually moving product? Because at the end of the day, what a brand wants is to sell stuff, right? They want to, it really is that click to buy, and I'm not going to use the terrible metaphor we already talked about from the 90s, but it is true. We want to sell clothing, movie tickets, an automobile. So just very quickly, start here, go down. What do you think is the first items of goods that will be sold? Because it's interesting to think about that, for instance, the luxury, luxury products have been so progressive. Well, that's such a tiny bit. And where are those margins in terms of what's really going to be sold? Is it really pizza? What is it? Really quick. Product that will be sold through interactive advertising? Among the first things that will be big moving. I don't know, e-commerce? Um, yeah. Amazon retailers? Looking into our client base, I think it's uh, it's virtual products like telephone contracts, um, uh, um, television um, subscriptions, and and these kind of, of 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 goods that are sort of easy bookable through a click. I agree with that. Uh, one example we saw in the Netherlands when Netflix launched in the Netherlands a couple of months ago. Um, so we, we provided the syncing and we, we saw a huge amount of Netflix ads on all digital platforms uh, in sync with their TV spots and that really helped them to sell the yearly wave of the subscriptions. Uh. I, I think I would, I would have to concur that that seems very logical and you guys are far closer to this so I'm going to defer. I think it'll be uh, service oriented uh, companies, uh, travel, uh, that we found, you know, when we were doing this, uh, something that's very visual that gets people to respond and has a lot of uh, content. Those are going to be the people that that click first. But then I think, you know, it'll. I can't think of one category that probably wouldn't want this. I look forward to the day when I can sit in my bed, never leave, and just press a button, order anything I want, and send it to my 3D printer, and it'll be right there. Or Get it with delivered to my front door through a drone. I guess I'll learn how to fly drones. That'll be my next job. Well, I, I, on that note, I will say uh, we'll keep an eye out for those drones for you. I, I do think apparel will continue to be big uh, for the same reason, because there's um, the cultural identification, and it tends to be trendy, and those things that spike or not, and you get a hit. Um, and you look at QVC and HSN, which, of course, has tracked that behavior in a very different way. But when it all becomes infotainment, advertainment in something else altogether. There's going to be a lot of Mickey Mouse ears sold. And I would just totally um, like to say, please don't forget retail and immersive environments and closing that loop in the final distributed video to anywhere we are, what that might look like too. Thank you very much for being with us this morning. Give them a big hand. Thank you.